Let's welcome on stage a group chief executive and managing director PKT Logistic Group Senang Berhad Yang Berbahagia Datuk Seri Dr Michael Teo. Please put your hands together to welcome Yang Berbahagia Datuk Seri Dr Michael Teo. So we have put a seat hanging on the stage and next let's welcome Director Halal Trade and Marketing Center HTMC Dubai UAE Mr Thomas Guerrero Blanco And next our guest speaker Mr Alim Sidiki Matabala Guyapal Group Manager Promotion and Public Relation Group Philippine Economic Zone Authority Philippines And allow me to introduce and hand over the program to our moderator for this session. Let me share his short profile. He's the chairman of Hong Leong Islamic Bank and board of Hong Leong Bank, co-founder of IA Group, and focusing on large-scale transformation. And led three global consulting firms: Cap Gemini, Trust and Young, and PA Consultant. He is currently board of trustees of Malaysia Economic Research and board of. SPRM. Well, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hand together to welcome Yang Berbahagia, Dato Dr Hamzah Kasim, Chairman of Hong Leong Islamic Bank and Board of Directors, Malaysian Institute of Economic Research. And I would like to hand this session over to Yang Berbahagia, Dato Dr Hamzah Kasim. Over to you, Dato. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum. Good morning. Uh, this is the first session. Uh, um, we will probably we hope to see more people coming in <laughs> later. And um, uh, this session is the, the lead, to lead the scenario of the whole uh, of the whole uh, probably the next few uh, hours of other session that will continue. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Halim for inviting me and the Secretariat. Uh, we have a distinguished uh, panel today, uh, and um, I will introduce some of the panel, and uh, I had a chat with them. So we have um, a session uh, of an hour, and uh, the, the, each of us can take, the panel can take 10 minutes uh, to speak, and um, after that we have a question and answer session, and also, you know, probably you can participate uh, in this, uh, uh, in the question and answer session. Um, uh, the, let me just first uh, introduce the, the speaker, uh, uh, the panel. On, uh, on my right is uh, Mr. Alim Siddiq. Uh, he has, uh, you have uh, probably you have seen his profile, but let me just read uh, briefly. Uh, he's been an expert in investment and promotion, and currently the CEO of, of the, um, uh, the trade zone in the in, uh, Philippines. Um, and... Um, he has been involved in, uh, in, in the halal uh, industry and was the first to organize the Islamic Finance uh, Conference in, uh, in the Philippines. So, um, and uh, probably he will speak uh, after uh, uh, Michael, uh, I mean Michael will speak first uh, and then followed by Dato Sri and you will speak the third one. So we also uh, have, you know, so here's some um, um, uh, a lot of uh, experience in public policy, and I think he will focus a bit on policy innovation. Uh, Mr. Thomas, Mr. Thomas uh, uh, was born in Spain, um, and he been very passionate in Islamic economy and has been participating very well in Spain and also in the Latin American countries, uh, driving the Islamic uh, uh, and halal uh, industry. Um, he started his career has uh, in the uh, business business school and also in the intelligent uh, side of the, of the business. And, and um, uh, working at uh, the Institute, Alal as head of uh, Madrid office, international relation director, and, um, and has spoke in uh, uh, various uh, functions. He's currently based in UAE. Uh, so uh, he will uh, talk to us some of the challenges that uh, during the COVID uh, and how we are recovering, uh, you know, the different challenges that we face, particularly institutional barriers that we discussed uh, this morning. Um, um, and then we go to uh, Dr. Sri, Dr. Michael. 
group CEO um, of PKT uh, and also group MD of the uh, PKT, a leading logistic uh, provider. Uh, and he, he founded the firm and also uh, was a, a major, uh, had an experience in setting up the, uh, the logistic, uh, halal logistic in Japan for the, for the Olympic. Uh, uh, and it's a good, uh, a good, uh, good story to hear some of the challenges of uh, building a, a, a and supply chain logistic is today uh, a major, a major challenge uh, in the country. Uh, the first thing uh, I just want to, you know, set the scenario of the, uh, the conference. The first thing is that, um, you know, every crisis like COVID, uh, uh, as I said, uh, COVID is a, is a unique crisis because it has supply and also demand contraction. Uh, we never, you know, uh, most of us are economists and we normally have not uh, face a, a challenge when you have supply contraction and also demand contraction because of the closing of the, uh, of the borders and also the, the country during the COVID uh, a lot of company and like PKT and all things they have also to slow down their production and also and that is called the, the sort of supply contraction and you have also uh, demand contraction where consumers uh, have not going up you know the retail are sh uh, but it, it has also uh, uh, created a new opportunities and, uh, and for the bank providers, uh, the, the COVID has been a blessing in disguise because people migrate to digitization. You know, uh, digitization accelerated uh, during the COVID and most, most uh, people won't go to the, even in the early phase of the, uh, of the COVID, they don't even to touch the ATM machine because they're worried about infection. So a lot of people do home, line, you know, home banking and they do online banking. So um, COVID has, uh, has uh, created a new behavioral change for the consumers and that has impact on the halal industry because uh, uh, the way it will evolve in the future. So, and the lesson learned in, uh, in any crisis, uh, in 1998 crisis, we have financial crisis in Malaysia. Uh, we, you find that you know, uh, every crisis will leave deep scars. Uh, for example, uh, Penang, for example, have been uh, attracting FDIs uh, pre-financial pre, pre crisis. Uh, you know, we were growing around 9% GDP a year, the highest in the history of economic growth. In, in not many, many countries grow at 9%. Then that reached to the whole uh, development of Penang uh, electronic clusters. And many of the companies in Penang, you know, I, 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 I did my, my doctoral thesis on electronic clusters uh, development. And, and uh, Penang, uh, many of the company became, you know, part of the global supply chain. They are part of the production networks, you know. So, so when anything happened around the world, they, it will ultimately have the impact. Like now, we have a shortage of semiconductors uh, uh, around the world. Uh, so, um, so that, that's, a, that's a very key part of the, uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, of the financial crisis. And, and, but we don't know what are the scars that, we, that will be uh, you know, left in, in the uh, uh, post-COVID, you know, some deep scars. Uh, but some industry has been uh, nearly destroyed, like the travel industry, uh, the tourism industry. Um, and the retail industry, you know, in Penang, also a lot of uh, coffee shops and all this thing closed. Uh, but emerging new sectors, uh, online uh, uh, become, you know, the tech companies make a huge, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, profit because of the, uh, of the COVID. And also we find uh, gov uh, the huge behavioral change uh, in terms of the way business will operate in the future. So that's uh, uh, number one in terms of post-COVID impact, and we will discuss this uh, later in, in, the what, what, in what way uh, COVID has impacted the, the, the halal industry. Then we have the post-COVID recovery, which is uh, when we were doing in MIR, uh, you know, the scenario what post-COVID uh, recovery is all about. I don't think we expect this sort of scenario today. This is in my living memory of, you know, um, looking at economic development this is the first time I have seen multiple challenges at the same time. The confluence of many serious events. Number one is the, uh, the supply chain disruption that we're having today. And uh, PKT uh, uh, Logistics will talk about some of this supply chain disruption. We have inflation, uh, which is becoming a, a, a serious issue around the world. 
Although Malaysia inflation is around 3.5, 3.8%, but the food inflation is around 9%. Okay. So, so you take the basket uh, of goods, uh, it, it, it looks like 3.5% because we subsidize a lot on petrol and gas. So that's the key thing among the lowest uh, in the region in terms of uh, oil and gas prices. Number three is the food security, which is becoming a bigger challenge because of the Ukraine. And, and uh, food security become a, a big issue, even for the halal uh, uh, economy, because uh, many Islamic countries import uh, food from the West. So when you have the disruption of the uh, supply chain from uh, Ukraine, you end up with the with uh, uh, inflation and food security issues. Uh, uh, in a every country uh, have this problem today. The third issue, uh, the fourth one that we are seeing is a, pot uh, a potential view of recession. Because of the interest rate uh, height that we are seeing today, uh, you know, uh, banks are uh, you know, um, uh, increasing the interest rate because U.S. interest rate is been moving very fast because they want to tame inflation. Uh, that's why you raise interest rate. But it can also lead to recession, and that's worrying many industries. Uh, because we live in an interconnected world. So one country that uh, you know, um, takes some measures like U.S., every country around the world is infected. So, so our currency is so under stress because of the interest rate uh, thing. So you have a confluence, and you have geopolitics you know, between uh, China and U.S. and Europe. So geopolitics is also another tension. So you have many confluence of if, uh, event that has um, huge impact in the future. And, and every country try to be self-reliant. You know, we, we talk, you know, they're trying to produce their face masks. Their, you know, everybody is trying to be self-reliant. But you, 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 you cannot really do everything on your own because you require economic scale and a lot of components come from, very, from different parts of the world. So, so, so this, the scenario that we are seeing has a, a huge impact in the way the, halal, the state of the halal economy today and the way we operate in the future. So I would uh, first, you know, probably we will discuss all this issue and we'll have a free flow of discussion and conversation. And I will invite, uh, you know, uh, um, Michael to start this and, and probably share his insight about some of the, uh, some of the scenario and the challenges that he's facing uh, being based in Dubai and the Emirates and uh, will share and what's going on in those parts of the world. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, Dr. Hamza, uh, for your wonderful introduction. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. First of all, obviously, I would like to express my deep gratitude to the organizers for inviting me to be here in, in Penang, uh, participating in this uh, amazing uh, event. Congratulations on the initiative. Uh, my name is Thomas Guerrero. I'm the manager of the Halal Trade uh, Marketing Center. HTMC is a global business development center focused on the halal economy opportunities uh, for the industry. So basically, we are facilitating halal trade worldwide. It's a Dubai government organization for helping organizations across the world to expand their business operations in the 57 Muslim majority countries where the halal certification is mandatory compulsory for marketing different types of uh, consumer goods, such as food, cosmetics, or pharma products. So going uh, directly to the, to the point, uh, obviously today we are here for talking uh, about uh, the halal market. And when we talk about the halal market, we are talking mostly about uh, the opportunities, business one, but uh, I think we also have to talk about uh, challenges. Um, obviously, uh, the first one is the, I think, the basic one is related to the uh, regulation framework. We don't have a clear regulation framework. We have different rules for regulating the same market. So this uh, fragmentation is becoming as a barrier for many companies in Muslim and non-Muslim countries for trading or for doing business in the halal space. And here, for example, thinking about uh, technology, because that will be one of the points uh, during our panel discussion, I think we can try to uh, adopt, for example, blockchain technology. Because when we talk about halal, we are talking mostly from the regulation point of view about traceability. 
So for increase and ensure uh, traceability, transparency, uh, accountability, as well as integrity, maybe we can try to start to bring those uh, disruptive technologies into these uh, wonderful and uh, fast-growing business needs to try to have a clear regulation as well as a clear uh, traceability uh, system. So technology could be uh, useful also from that point of view for trying to solve this first uh, issue. Uh, then we also have, or we are also facing uh, problems sometimes for, let's say, uh, facilitating trade. Uh, we are uh, bringing, for example, here in the GCC countries, the, we are uh, importing around the 75% of the food that we are consuming. And we are bringing uh, that food from non-Muslim majority countries, mostly from Australia, Brazil, European countries, and so on. So now with this uh, disruptive uh, issue with the logistic change, we have to think how to find those goods from uh, closer uh, countries or how to develop those uh, uh, sectors in our home countries to avoid that dependency and try to, uh, you know, have uh, this uh, food security, for example, uh, in place. Um, from that point of view, for example, I'm thinking about Asian countries. Here, again, in the F&B space, uh, you have uh, very good uh, quality as well as uh, you have competitive prices. But companies here, they are not, uh, many of them, they are not exporting out of Asian region. So maybe e-commerce, maybe some of those uh, also technology tools can help companies here to export their products to the MENA region or to the GCC countries. So we will be able there to diversify our uh, suppliers because, for example, for the meat, for animal protein, we have three, four big supplier, but maybe we can go uh, further and try to find new ones in Asia or for other uh, food categories, no? And then halal is also about uh, promotion. So then, and coming back to the technology approach, metaverse could also work to find new ways of promoting uh, halal uh, products uh, across the world. So. Uh, basically, I think uh, technology, we, we, we can't miss this opportunity to uh, bring technology into the halal uh, space and maybe through uh, those, uh, you know, uh, technology solutions we can solve some, maybe not all, but some of those uh, issues. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I will pass to uh, Dato Sri. Your session. We'll do we, a question and answer after we finish all the presentation. Okay, over to you. Uh, hello, good morning. Uh, basically, uh, I'm also representing uh, Logistics Productivity Nexus uh, under MPC in terms of how to improve the productivity of logistics in Malaysia. Now, I think the disruption that happened. Uh, everybody need to understand that due to the lockdown in different timing between European uh, countries, uh, US and Asia, uh, that actually has disrupted the container supply uh, for uh, the container supply to different region at different time. So imagine uh, we started with China lockdown, and because of China lockdown, all the container arrived in China cannot come out. So all the U.S. have empty container. So because of that, then there's no container. Demand and supply increase the price of ocean freight from U.S. sector towards China sector. When China start opening up, U.S. lockdown. So all the container from China arrive in U.S. As a result, once it arrive, it congests the U.S. port, and there's no more container in China because there's the lack of supply of container because the container is not returning from U.S. back to China the ocean freight in China also increased. So because of that, the disruption actually increased the ocean freight. So uh, shipping lines make a lot of 
money because of this disruption. On top of that, if you, are not, uh, if you can remember the Swiss Canal, uh, Evergreen stuck at Swiss Canal caused a seven-day congestion. That seven-day caused billions of uh, dollars of trade losses because uh, the vessel cannot pass through the Swiss Canal to leave from Asia to go to Europe side as well. So that kind of disruption is uh, uh, the one that is causing <coughs> the ocean freight to increase. On top of that, then the oil price actually jumped from, uh, from quite low, about, at that time about 50 US dollar, went up to 100 over US dollar. So then the, oil, the shipping line used another excuse to continue this momentum of price increase uh, to uh, basically uh, cause the logistics price to increase. So don't be mistaken that uh, the logistics cost has increased uh, only in the shipping cost. But in terms of land logistics, it has been quite stable, especially in Malaysia, because our gas gasoline price is subsidized. So therefore, there is not much disruption locally, but only if the items is imported or to be exported, there is a disruption in the price as well. So this is uh, what I, I saw. Uh, and also, Due to the pandemic, people actually stopped uh, traveling due to the lockdown and there's no many people buying cars. I, can, I cannot imagine during the lockdown when you cannot even come out from your house, you want to buy a car. So the car sales dropped tremendously. Uh, even the production uh, was stopped uh, due to uh, they are not essential items as well. So because of that, uh, if I'm a microchips uh, manufacturer, and uh, the other side of the world asking for more computer microchips. So I switched my production from automotive uh, microchips to computer microchips. So much demand that, uh, that when the, we start opening up the economy, you start buying car, then the car guys ask the microchips manufacturer to supply car man microchips. They say, oh, sorry, those days you say that you cannot buy from me. Now I have re-switched my production to computers. So it's very difficult for them to switch back to automotive. So as a result, now we cause a, a shortage of microchips, not for every sector, but especially in automotive sector. And that is the disruption that uh, we observe. Uh, in terms of halal market, uh, I have the slide here. I Google when, uh, when you are asking me about what's the future if you look at it, in 2020, uh, we have uh, 7.2 tr trillion or trillion US dollar market, global halal market. In the year 2028, okay, la, 2021 and 2022 was disrupted. So you can move the chart a bit down. But then again, uh, you are looking at the upward trend for halal market uh, up to 11.2 trillion dollar. Uh, in the year 2028. So that is very good future. So whatever happened in a crisis is, uh, is something like that. It's like elastic. So it's supposed to move normal, but then due to the uh, pandemic, they pull it down. So after the pandemic, they will let it go. It will jump. It will, it, will, it will bounce back, but it will be like that for a while. So this caused the uncertainty in the market. So the market will have to settle down and then everything adjusts by itself until it reaches equilibrium. So this is pure demand and supply, uh, uh, the one that I'm observing now. Of course, price increase. Some people try to take advantage, uh, increase the price, the, hold the supply, push the price up, especially the construction industry as well. So there was a lot of disruption in the price everywhere because uh, human being greedy, they want to make extra profit because for the couple of years, they have not made so much profit. They lost quite a bit. So this is the advantage for them. Can you have the next slide now? Yep. Okay. So I also Google and I found out that actually the best, the country best position to capitalize on this economic, uh, Islamic economic is actually Malaysia. Uh, we are actually the leader in uh, in halal market uh, because our Jakim uh, certification is known worldwide, especially in the Middle East, uh, because it's most trustworthy uh, uh, certification. 
So that put Malaysia in a very good position. And we are considered the leading uh, country in uh, setting out the standard for halal certification uh, in the world. Okay, next. And the future, if you look at it, the, the, chai, the, the part, I mean, the, the whole pie here, you look at Islamic financing. Uh, I think uh, our panel speaker here is one of them. Uh, who is the leader who started all this Islamic financing? Malaysia. So it is quite a big chunk here. By the year 2023, we are looking at a 3.8 billion, uh, 3.8 trillion uh, uh, dollars in uh, halal Islamic financing, uh, followed by halal food uh, and halal travel. Now you get halal travel. Before that, I don't think anybody had actually thought of that niche market uh, to bring you for halal. Uh, travel all the way to Korea. It's all food, it's halal food and everything. So, modest fashion, uh, halal media and recreation, pharmaceutical, now people become aware, they ask about the, the medicine that they are taking, is this halal or not? And of course, cosmetic is one of the biggest boom in Malaysia. I will see a lot of uh, entrepreneurs came out, a lot of social media entrepreneurs came out and uh, selling cosmetic, in especially halal cosmetic. So that is doing quite a big job in Malaysia. So I would say, um, overall, I think halal has a big potential. Uh, I was uh, personally involved uh, in trying to set up halal supply chain in Japan. I would, I would assume a lot of you travel to Japan, and uh, you, when you reach Japan, I know that you go to 7-Eleven, buy your own bread, uh, buy your own uh, tuna fish, you go back to your room and you make your own sandwich and you make your own food. Or also you, 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 you take away some of your sambal to go to uh, overseas to, so that you can actually have your food. The reason is because in Japan, they don't even understand what you mean by halal. All right? And there are actually 30 over halal certification body in Japan they are trying to certify uh, due to Olympic in 2020. Just... Five years before Olympic, they were actually sourcing for halal food because they knew uh, during the Olympic 2020 there will be millions of um, uh, Islam, uh, what uh, Muslims will be coming over to Japan, and they know they're going to have an acute shortage of food for them. So can you imagine all the tourists go to Japan? None of them is halal because even you go to the simplest things sushi restaurant, they also not halal because they also have the soup make from pork or other things, you know. So, they, you, it's very difficult to find in Japan. So, the Japanese was trying very hard to understand uh, halal. So, I went there uh, trying to bring one of the uh, famous Malaysian uh, fried chicken brand to, uh, uh, to, to the Olympic 2020. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very big in Middle East. Mary Brown. So, uh, then at that time, we went uh, and sourced for a warehouse to keep the, 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 the chicken, you know. So, somehow or other, all the Japanese warehouses are multi-story. Then the Japanese introduced us, okay, don't worry, I will keep your food on the fourth floor because on the bottom is pork, <laughs> uh, the second layer is chicken, this is beef, and this is pork, uh, this is uh, chicken. So, I say, then how did all this uh, meat travel using the same leaf? So you can't. I mean, in a way, uh, in uh, halal food, we can't. So, uh, and then I tell the Japanese, they say, hey, michael Sang, this is impossible. We cannot be reserving the whole warehouse for you. Clean it uh, to the halal uh, way method and then uh, waiting for you to bring in your chicken and with your uh, volume is so small, we cannot... Uh, 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 help you in that. And subsequently, I think some of you may have read that uh, some Japanese restaurant actually declared as halal and then uh, some tourists went there to eat and then they saw some uh, non-halal item inside the kitchen and they took a picture, it became viral. So that is a challenge uh, in uh, halal because the lack of understanding uh, in other countries. But now we also have inquiry not only from Japanese to know about halal uh, logistics, even Korean are now making inquiry to Malaysian to help them 
to do halal logistics in Korea as well. So I think um, I would say that the halal market has a very good future because it's growing and people are getting to know more and more about it and uh, the travelling, the tourism will bounce back and then the halal food will also bounce back as well. Inter uh, the interesting uh, uh, when you're mentioning about you know uh, Japan is that uh, when you go to a new country the whole ecosystem is not there a lot of education has to be done uh, things like Penang like PKT has a uh, uh, strength to become the advice uh, to other countries uh, to, uh, that's moving into the uh, because logistics supply chain is the most complex and halal is it's equally more complex because, of the, as you said, you cannot separate. You have to separate. The, you need the cold chain, and and also you have to meet the standards. Uh, you know that we have Malaysian standards for warehousing. You're, you're aware about the, the standards by Sirim on halal by by the standard body on for warehousing for halal. So it's, it's quite so. Supply chain is a, is a major pillars of uh, you know when you are establishing uh, uh, Islamic uh, uh, the halal industry. So. People like BKT has a very strong, uh, you know, uh, capability to advise. Uh, but um, so let me go to Philippines and 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 look at uh, because uh, one of the area probably you will also discuss about the ASEAN, uh, uh, you know, uh, intra trade among the ASEAN country. Uh, I, I find Thailand is very strong in Islamic uh, tourism um, because it's Islamic to tourism drive the Hadal market. So if, when the tourist goes in, as you say, they don't find the food, and then the demand side, um, if you're food, you want to attract Islamic tourism, you have to have the infrastructure. Uh, so, so Islamic uh, inter, uh, tourism is the catalyst to the halal economy. So over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Datu Hamza. Um, again, our salutation to everyone. Thank you for joining us this session. Allow me also to give my salutation to our uh, municipal mayor coming from Lano del Sur, who had uh, flew this morning to join the conversation today, and hopefully to all also meet you. Um, we are joined also here from the Philippines by the mayor of the municipality of Tamparan, Muhammad Johar de Sumimba, uh, de Maporo. Thank you so much, Mayor, for joining us. Uh, again, with the response to the query on the challenges, uh, as mentioned by the two speakers earlier, there is still a lot of misconception. And I would like to also address that to uh, the issue on um, making this a venue to also uh, develop the market in some countries, especially like the Philippines, where we are majority non-Muslims. And I'd like to follow the framework given earlier by one of our guest speakers, uh, Professor Aniko, she mentioned about the three Ps. Uh, one is the public, and to address the issue of the misconception and the non-appreciation of the market. From the public perspective, uh, we in the Philippine Economic Zone Authority, where we manage 417 ag zones and exporters around 4,670, we address it by, by uh, uh, a strategy called the whole of government approach or the whole of ecosystem approach. Now, when you are in the government, the first thing that you have to do is to make sure that you are engaged, like what Professor Cole mentioned and what Dr. Hamza mentioned earlier, we make sure to provide the bridge for the appreciation of the halal market and, and so with Islamic finance. So what we have done so far in the Philippines is to make sure that other agencies in the Philippine government would also do, understand the context of the market, not just from the perspective of making it accessible to the Muslim Filipinos. But hey, there is a potential growth in this particular venue that when you engage the Middle Eastern market, when you engage the Southeast Asian market, and by the way, the majority of the buyer doesn't come from these countries. They actually come from the United States, the U U US uh, and Europe. And this is where we would like to convey the message as far as the Philippine Economic Zone Authority is concerned. Now, as part of our transition framework, we are also aiming to translate the creation of halal hubs in the country by providing a mechanism where there will be a venue to accommodate them. And out of the 417 economic zones that we are managing, 40 of those are potentially in the area 
of the border between the Brunei, India, Malaysia, Philippines, East growth area. So there we see the potential. From the perspective of the private sector, we always need to have them realize that in this sector, either within the halal, uh, that uh, uh, Seri Michael mentioned earlier about the exponential growth of the market, even during the pandemic, is for them to appreciate that in this particular industry, there are two things. One, ease of doing business, and two, transparency. And that, as you mentioned earlier, it is a welcoming venue for the business because associated with the context of Islamic finance and halal is the context of ethical financing and the context of gold standard, which at the Philippine market are slowly appreciating at the moment. And then the third part of the framework given earlier by Professor Aniko, she mentioned about people. There we introduce the context of DEIA, which most of you are familiar with. For some of my colleagues here, um, earlier I met some of the alumni from the Asian Institute of Management where I came from. We need to provide venue from the communities, from the, uh, the municipalities, the provinces, uh, all sectors of the society being able to, uh, rep to be represented in this sector, in the conversation of both developing the halal economy and the facility of Sharia financing. What we, we had this program called DEIA, Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Accessibility. And if we manage to communicate those, um, those appreciation of making them understand that in this market, there is a venue for growth, there is a venue for increasing the GDP, and there is a venue to making sure that no one stays at home without being fed. We're, what we're talking about here is the, the, the venue for them to realize that there is an opportunity here. And that to uh, finally conclude in my, in my, in my um, sharing, uh, we are also bridging the gap of not just managing the corporations or the big companies. We want small players. And most of you who, who are here who would like to include Philippines as part of your venue for export and investment, we welcome SMEs who are mostly represented here. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Uh, when I, I, you, that the three was pointing out to Islamic finance, why Malaysia is leading Islamic finance for many years, and what I'm saying is that um, others are catching very fast too. Uh, I would say our friends from Indonesia are very serious uh, in catching up. But why is Islamic finance uh, 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 quite successful in Malaysia? Because of one single thing. Because we have a tough regulator which is Bank Negara. This is the only sector where it's highly regulated and they will tell you what to do and you have to fulfill like Islamic first. In many of the banks, it's Islamic first. So, you know, because you have a regulatory body that oversees the whole industry, you can actually shape the, the, the development industry locally and globally, uh, you know, issuing the first soko and all those things. Other industry, you don't have a regulatory uh, bodies. And this is why in halal, sometimes you have too many regulating bodies and you have too many standards uh, and too many players and become very fragmented in the industry. Um, but when you see that growth, the one that is driving is the financial sectors. But uh, food comes secondary and then you have now lifestyle um, and also they call modest fashion design. And these are emerging, uh, you know, different countries are, uh, uh, quite unique. I think in Dubai they are also pushing for the for the fashion models design in Turkey. Um, so there are many sectors. So so I think the if you look at the trajectory that you show, it is growing because the the Islamic community, the co consumer is growing around the the world. And when they migrate to Europe, they create the demand. You know when there's I was in uh, you know before the civil war, I was in Syria managing, advising them on the economy, but. Um, you see uh, the cross-migration of Muslims to Europe also create the demand for halal in, in Europe. So what I'm saying is that the future is there, but uh, there's so many barriers that, that, you know, how do we resolve this? Uh, number one that I want to ask the panel is that, um, how do we harmonize standards across the region in order to, uh, to move forward? It's an institutional issue, uh, uh, you know, um, because we need to identify 
you know, uh, some, some key areas that we can lead to greater harmony, at least among the ASEAN countries. We don't expect the part of the world, but among the ASEAN countries, harmonization of standards is important. And like logistics, warehouse, and all this supply chain among ASEAN, uh, cold chain, Islamic, uh, you know, within Philippines, Indonesia, and Thailand. This is an interesting area to look at, and, and then going to the Middle East. Uh, number two is, you know, what innovation we need to introduce. I, uh, uh, digital transformation is happening, and uh, in the next session, you will hear that some of our companies are using, you know, um, uh, the blockchain for their track and trace. So a lot of uh, uh, experiment in digitization is already happening in the halal economy. We just need to ac accelerate. So these two questions, how do we accelerate digitization even in the supply chain, you know, and how do we uh, like um, try to harmonize, uh, find better understanding among, at least among the Asian countries. Uh, and uh, at once ASEAN can, can, you know, find a better harmonization, then they can also go to the global market, you know, as a, as a single community. So, you want to try to ask, uh, to answer this question, or Dr. Sri, you want to start first? Uh, this is very interesting, uh, Dato, uh, very challenging uh, to harmonize the halal uh, certification body, because every country also wants to, to take their lead as well. Uh, because there are costs involved uh, in uh, getting certification. Uh, I would say that uh, the most important thing is the consumer trust uh, which uh, halal certification. Uh, I would say the Middle East people. So I think so far it's still Malaysia. Malaysia is the leading one. So I would assume that um, within the ASEAN Secretariat, they need to compare uh, the standard that's set by Jakim and, uh, uh, of course, Thailand uh, halal certification body, Vietnam certification body, Cambodia, and, and so forth. And then uh, we come to an agreement uh, that is uh, so that uh, where they, they're going to adopt some of Malaysia plus uh, relax some so that it become an ASEAN halal certification body. So maybe that will be the method. How does the supply chain is used among ASEAN countries? The logistic, you know, what can be done to improve the, the, the halal logistic? I mean, if you were given the choice to do that. Yeah, so uh, the, the challenge here is uh, uh, when you talk about transportation, um, we are actually more stricter than uh, other countries. Uh, we don't allow the same truck to take halal and non-halal food even though it's no pork uh, inside there as well. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean if, even if it's a can of uh, uh, food that is actually non-halal. So uh, Malaysia is stricter than other countries. So uh, I think ad adoption is more of Malaysia consumer. And the consumer that consume halal situation in, uh, in, in other countries. That is why I would say, always say that Malaysia is a very suitable country to become a halal hub. Uh, but then, only thing is, uh, government side need to be a bit more flexible. Uh, but uh, you see, like, for example, Singapore, uh, they are more flexible in that area that uh, a lot of uh, bulk cargo was exported from Singapore, uh, from overseas to Singapore. And where they're going to do, pick, uh, they're going to do packing into the small packing and get their, their local halal certification to certify that and give a certificate of origin made in Singapore and re-export to other countries. So, Malaysia side need to be a bit more flexible. Yeah. So, you mean the people like Jakim, our favourite organisation, uh, should be more uh, business-friendly, you know? Uh, business-friendly. Yeah, right. Business-friendly. Uh, business. Besides to be just Islam, uh, I mean, they have to comply to Sharia requirement, but they have to be looking from the perspective of the thing. But uh, that balance is quite tough because you need to maintain trust. You know, once you become flexible, you, sometimes you can you lose your trust. Too. So that is also, a, a, I don't know, how, what do you feel about this? Well, that, that's true, uh, but uh, I concur with your point of view. I think uh, accreditation bodies, halal ones, also certifiers, uh, you know, the, also the bodies in charge of uh, coming with the standards, they have to be more uh, business friendly. 
sometimes uh, behind those organizations you have uh, very good people in terms of uh, religious skills, but they didn't uh, visit one company in their lives. So they are regulating uh, the market and they are coming with the requirements for the companies when maybe they don't have uh, the right knowledge, let's say, for uh, adopting some uh, requirements from the halal point of view. So sometimes those uh, requirements, thinking also about companies working with halal in non-Muslim majority countries, they are not cost effective. For example, talking about logistics. Maybe for trading between Muslim countries, it makes sense to have these uh, halal logistics uh, requirements, uh, strong ones, but uh, for trading with the non-Muslim world, sometimes those requirements are not uh, making sense. And we need to find, let's say, a different uh, solution, a smart ones, in, in order to comply with halal, to have the traceability, to avoid cross-contamination, to keep the trust on the system, but also facilitating trade, no? And for that, coming back again to the harmonization uh, process, that's something uh, critical. Uh, from my point of view, sometimes I'm perceiving that uh, some countries, Muslim ones, they are trying to compete not with their products or their marketing, with the rules. They are using halal certification as a barrier or as a tool for competing with all the Muslim, because we saw the data. The market is growing so fast. It's a huge market. So the competition is also big. And many Muslim countries, they are trying to conquest or they are trying to lead this market. Okay, try to compete with your product, with your marketing, with your packages, but not using the rules. We have clear rules and we have to uh, we, have the, we, we need to have the same rules to have, by the way, a fair competition. Because, for example, sometimes it's so funny talking to Muslim organizations, talking to Muslim uh, companies in Central Asia or in Africa. Because of the regulation, they are not exporting to other Muslim majority countries. So the intra OIC uh, trade is not uh, working well. And Imagine we are in the Middle East bringing food, for example, as I said, from US, from Brazil, from Australia, from non-Muslim majority countries. And we can maybe try to bring the same product from other Muslim, but they can't supply those products to us because of the regulation. When we have a SMIC, for example, in place, the standardization body coming from the OIC, why not to harmonize, why not to follow the same rules and avoid this, let's say, uh, crazy fragmentation, uh, you know, regulation, because it's not only b bad for, for, for the Muslims, for the non-Muslim countries trying to do business in the Muslim world. It's also bad for the Muslim countries. Some of them, they can't because they are not complying or they don't understand how to comply when in principle, they must be clear and they agree on what halal is. So imagine from our perspective, we need to, to do something with that. You know, sure. sure. Yeah, just, just imagine the, the last uh, disruption we have in the chicken, <laughs> where we have not enough chicken in Malaysia. And, uh, and then uh, the other government open up and say, okay, Vietnam say I can supply you chicken. Hey, sorry, your chicken not halal. <laughs> not slaughtered in a halal way. But in Japan, uh, I, 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 as I say that, <coughs> the demand for wayu beef is uh, tremendous. Uh, but the Japanese uh, slaughterhouse have problem uh, uh, actually segregating the same slaughterhouse for halal and non-halal. So what they have decided recently is to set up new slaughterhouse for, for halal market. So I would assume one day, uh, all the meat, uh, uh, even for Japanese consumption, will automatically be also halal. Yeah. They can segregate the, 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 the business line, By right, the production line. They can segregate, line. but then uh, because of the certification is so strict, yes. then the, co the cross-contamination will happen, 
and that's why they, they don't allow that. So then they had so, no choice but to set up a new slaughterhouse. So many cost of meat may go up as well. Yes, but if you have enough business to do that, okay, wonderful. But if not, how to justify the investment to come with a new factory only for halal? That's also, you know, the point behind many companies in Japan or in other non-Muslim majority countries. They prefer to go through a segregation to have the traceability. And by the way, if you segregate the full production line and you keep everything under control, you can keep the halal, uh, let's say, uh, traceability system in place and without this huge investment uh, behind. Yeah, I, I think a lot of this issue, even during COVID, they were asking whether the vaccine is halal or not. You know? So some people are anti-vaccine because they are not sure whether it's a halal vaccine. So because of health, they, but now government has to look at this uh, uh, carefully because if you want full vaccination, uh, uh, yeah. and maybe you want to add to this. Uh, two points from the perspective of the uh, the ASEAN. Uh, I think it was already raised earlier. Uh, what are the intervention for a country? But uh, there should be uh, ASEAN has the secretariat, and there should be a regulation to assist countries who had the difficulty of uh, providing the standard required. I mean, it's a competition in the first place. So uh, from the from the part of those countries who had who still need to be part of the competition. We also need to upgrade our requirements. And um, I, I did my paper in the U.S. ASEAN Halal uh, Initiative in American University in Washington, D.C. And the appreciation of most of the interview that we, we had done is that there is a strong um, uh, note and brand that when you say halal, especially in the U.S. market, it's a work as one entity in the ASEAN. There should be an exponential growth by also making sure that the countries who had the difficulty of, uh, of providing those requirements be able to compete. So the, again, um, we're talking about Islamic finance and halal, halal. There is that note on corporate social responsibility, especially within our neighbors. You, you were mentioning in Philippines, Islamic finance is very important as part of the ecosystem to support the halal industry. So it's also in, in the Middle East. Um, so Islamic finance is, uh, is accepted worldwide, but in Europe, they call it ethical finance. You know, so I, when I go to conference in, in Europe, they, they call ethical finance, but actually it's partly uh, Islamic finance. So you find uh, halal food also will become in future ethical food, you know, uh, beside organic food, because like if Japan start to move in to do this. So the future is good, but the question is, how do we, you know, how do we capture this opportunity as the next growth for individual enterprise and country? How do, what need to be one or two, three things that need to be done that we can ride on this growth uh, momentum in spite of all this confluence of event that is uh, happening around the world, uh, in Malaysia or the in Middle East? Of the, what are the two, three things that you need to do to really ride on this growing trend of uh, Islamic uh, halal industry? Because uh, food is only one sector. Uh, we have uh, Islamic finance, but the other three, four areas like Islamic fashion, you know, animation, uh, all these are new emerging sectors are coming in. And we have the fintech and the, the whole startup ecosystem now is also focusing on the Islamic side, you know. So it's a new generation of small enterprise that are coming in to introduce digitization in the Islamic economy. You know, one of the areas I'm I'm health assisting the government is to do the Islamic digital economy uh, and I think uh, 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 a new ecosystem to be set up in Malaysia to accelerate Islamic digital economy because the e-commerce, uh, the, the animation, edu education is also big industry to deliver Islamic education. Uh, you know, Malaysia, uh, Islamic finance education is quite good because we, we train people around the world in Islamic finance. It's a, it's a big industry for some of the universities. So what are two, three things we need to do to really capture this opportunity of growth of the halal industry? Should we, uh, we look at different focus new areas? Do, uh, besides harmonization, you know, um, because harmonization is only like food is very strict. The non-food industry is also a big one coming up. Yes. Sure, fully agree. But they are facing the same uh, problems, right. mostly cosmetics, pharma, modest fashion, 
all those, uh, let's say, emerging halal sector, they are also facing the same uh, problems. But uh, going uh, to the Islamic finance uh, point of view, for example, in the MENA region, as I said, we are importing around 67% uh, of the uh, consumer goods that we are uh, buying or consuming there. So those goods, those goods mostly coming from non-Muslim countries, where they are producing halal products, food, cosmetics, pharma, according to the existing halal standards, but for producing those products, they are using Western conventional banking and finance systems. So it's like a paradox. They are producing halal, but using haram uh, money. Uh, and <laughs> we have two big, uh, let's say, sectors. We have the halal and the Islamic finance and banking. Why not to connect them? Why not to help you know, those companies in the Muslim and non-Muslim countries producing halal to get access to the Islamic banking and finance systems. Because sometimes we have uh, that uh, paradox. Um, I think we are uh, losing the, the, the opportunity to make this even bigger. If we connect those uh, funds, those uh, banks, those uh, institutions with the producers, I'm sure they will find in the way to grow, to do business, to expand, to internationalize. Sometimes when I'm delivering presentations in uh, non-Muslim majority countries, I'm trying to explain to the companies, to the producers there, that, okay, when you get the HALA certification, you are able to export and they are only coming with this idea. I want to get the certification because I want to export to Malaysia, to the UAE, to Saudi Arabia. But sometimes I'm saying, why not to think about once you get the halal certification, maybe that business line, not the full company, but that business line is Sharia compliant. And you can get access to Islamic banking, finance, and opening the gate for the producer for a new way of getting money or, you know, because thinking about IPOs, thinking about joint ventures, if you are Saria compliant or if you have the halal certification, maybe you can try for that specific business line to do something with the Islamic banking and finance players. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so... Uh, in our um, GOCC, government-owned owned controlled corporation, we're managing our uh, 46 billion exports in the country, and 20% 20, 20 of that is actually coming from Japan. And why? Because one of the best practices that we notice is the word A, accessibility of six international Japanese banks within the ambit of the locator, the semiconductor industry operating in the Philippines. And I have the same answer that too. Uh, we had to view this particular industry, Sharia compliant financing, from the perspective of market accessibility. And if we cannot provide that, then we have a problem. So again, uh, bottom line is, government institutions has a role to make sure that we provide the mechanisms of the accessibility of, of these banks. And it shouldn't be viewed as Islamic finance. It should be viewed as a mechanism to improve the life of people or businesses. That should be the, the selling point of Islamic finance. Not, o not only in Malaysia, not only in the global market, but especially in the countries where Muslims are minority. Thank you. I think, uh, uh, Thomas, for your information, uh, recently our bank, Nagara, have uh, improved the standard of Islamic financing further. Now they are no longer talking about uh, you have a halal certificate. You must be socially responsible as well. They call it value-based uh, customers, value-based uh, banks as well. So the value-based uh, financing will only give to the company that is socially responsible, right. not only just with a halal certification. Right. Halal certification, if you just follow the process, you have money, you can actually do halal certification. But if 
you are not socially responsible, how that should not be financing you. Because if you do some wrong, you cheat, uh, yeah. uh, you, you avoid income tax, uh, or you, you uh, treat your laborer very bad, Islamic financing should not be financing them. That's where Bank, Bank Negara recently asked Islamic financing, what is your role uh, in, in giving? It's just only cheap financing or, or you need to also consider uh, value-based customers as well. So we are moving towards a direction, I would say, uh, ESG goal, you know, ESG goal. So Islamic financing more of moving towards the direction being you must also pursuing that goal in order for you to get that kind of financing. Dato, I think you want to reply straight, is it? No, no, no. I, I'm just saying that, you know, uh, uh, being chairman of the bank, we always, uh, you know, been uh, overloaded with Spank Negara. Uh, the new one is, is the, I mean, what they call value-based intimidation. And you have to uh, have the three, people, profit, and planet, yes. you know. Yeah. The people is the manpower issue and planet is about your environmental issue. And of course, profit, bank has to do a profit, you know, they have, otherwise they won't survive. So, so um, that is where the shift to Islamic bank uh, to look at the whole three, the three P's, people, planet, and, 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 and profit. Yeah, yeah because I'm, I'm one of the ambassadors, I speak in the conference in Bank Nagara okay. to talk about how... Uh, PKT being a socially responsible company, that is why the bank borrows money, you know, at a uh, at a more competitive rates, uh, so All that right. we can do All business. Right. On top of that, uh, that just now the one of the question is what should we do uh, in order to for for Penang as well. I, I think uh, we should also consider uh, bringing in uh, food manufacturer to 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 solve the problem of food disruption. Uh, because currently, I think Penang, our focus is mainly talking about electronic customers uh, to come in and do manufacturing. So, in fact, there's other big uh, food manufacturers outside. They do not know that uh, the big benefit they can get from uh, relocating their factory from or starting up a new branch in Malaysia and uh, uh, so that we can manufacture uh, food that is halal right, right. and supply to the region. So instead of only focusing on attracting uh, E and E customers, maybe yes. in Penang, if we can attract some food manufacturers, then that will actually automatically make Penang as a hub for, for Islamic. For Islamic. Okay, uh, halal hub. thank you very much. Yeah. I know that time is not our side. We started ten minutes late. I'm just uh, uh, ten minutes. I mean, there's a signal for us to stop. So uh, anyway. Um, Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. And I was watching. The, I thought the balloon. Uh, so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, we have an exciting uh, panel, and I like uh, please thank all the 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 the, the, the panel. And uh, I like just conclude one or two points. The first is that you know the we are going through a very difficult time, but there are opportunities. And I think your suggestion that Penang should be the hub for food manufacturing is something that the invest Penang people need to look. And then they can work with all these three partnerships. And so, so then we have a bigger conference next year. So thank you so much. And, and, and um, uh, okay, let's move over to you.